Hello, Jeffrey. Hey. You got in a haircut. I did. <laughs> it was time. Yeah, it looks neat. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure if uh, anybody else is going to be Yeah, joined. yeah. Doug's out and uh, John's out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not Ed's kind of thing, I don't think. Is it? TJ said I think he was coming, though. Really? To this? Uh, uh, he said he was looking forward to Friday, so I assumed it was this. Maybe people are getting confused. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he was thinking about uh, Globes, as you were. But Globes is Thursday, not Friday. True. Yeah. Hmm. Well, <laughs> we'll see, I suppose. Because <laughs> I got confused about Slaughter Dick. I thought it was yesterday. So I'm glad it wasn't yesterday. It, it gave me a few days to um, get more into the rhythm of of this book yeah of this book yeah and i put aside slaughter dyke I, I got far enough that i knew i knew that i'd have enough time after this mm. meeting to go back and finish that chapter so i've been um in the last week mostly just reading this book uh and, but all and, this reading is very demanding i mean <laughs> i understand john's point of view it's like oh you want us to talk about so a mountain, but we're reading Slaughter Dyke and we're reading this and we're reading that. And it's like, how do you keep, you know, it's, it's hard to stay up with all the rhythms. Well, well he's partly responsible. <laughs> 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 but it's true. I, I feel that way. And Doug expressed and, and I concur that it's a bit like a program. It's a bit like it. And I didn't intend that. It seemed to just unfold that way. It, uh, it sometimes feels a bit like, I've got to read this, you know, and <laughs> I don't really, <clears throat> don't really want to feel like that for the yeah. reading. But yeah. you know, it's it's okay to a certain extent because it gets you to the next point. And and if I was reading it on my own, I'd probably put it one side and might not get back to it again for you know another year. So I'm kind of happy <clears throat> to be you know, pushing myself to read through it, but, but to uh, read th- through these things, but, uh, mm. but it is a challenge. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what to, what to say about that. Um, mm. because I'm, uh, I think there's a method to the, to the madness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit worried about the Oro Bindo, but, uh, cause I think that's a, a very different writing style which I'm, you know, I'm not quite sure about. But mm. <laughs> Are you worried about the difficulty of the text or the pace of the schedule or the, or something else? I don't know. I, I, I just, uh, anyway, I, I, I think it's, I mean, I'm open to reading this text, but I'm not sure that I'm going to agree with it. <laughs> so I'm sort of worried that I'm going to develop resistance as I go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I uh, have not read it at all. I have not read anything of, well, a few pages, just dipping in to get a feel for the writing style and, and the voice. And, but other than that, I'm fairly ignorant of oh, good Donna. Wow. Hi, Donna. Can you hear us? No. Okay. So it's not just you and I today. (laughs) Hopefully, we'll see. Um, 
the reading is a bit of a conundrum. I mean, from from for me too, uh, and there's a, almost like there seem a gap between the ideal state of existence where one would have, we would have, I would have time to read these books and give them as much time as they really uh, want from us. Or deserve or whatever, yeah. Yeah. Um, but then there are you know, other things going on that, that need attending to. There's yeah. some just uh, temporal uh, puzzle to, to uh, and it's always kind of changing and, you know, you add things to it. Uh, people come into to a conversation, goes in a certain direction. So, um, can we hear you now, Donna? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Good. Great. Welcome. I'm, gl I'm glad you made it back. Yeah, I did. <laughs> But I have to confess something. Mm -hmm. I finished chapter 17 and I'm about, I'm about to start chapter 18. I'm not as a good reader as you all. I mean, I've seen <laughs> the conversation, but, <laughs> but nevertheless, I said I will join as an audience and just, you know, give my reflections on the first uh, chapters. But I promise next time I'm going to finish the novel. <laughs> When I saw the, because I'd lost track of the fact that the, the reading was on Friday. Well, I had oh. looked at the chapter list. I had thought we were still on one to twenty, so I had oh, read really? four, and then when I saw <laughs> forty-two, I thought, oh dear. <laughs> so I read the rest between yesterday and today. So oh god, oh, okay. <laughs> oh so you crammed. <laughs> oh, that's kind of this book cannot be crammed. Uh, you know, no, that, but that's, it has, there's a kind of a, I don't know how, there's a, I don't know how to say it. There's a kind of a, of a, like you let go. You can't hold on to things when you're reading it because there's lots going on and it's, it's moving from one thing to the next, to the next. And so you, it's not like a story where you sort of hang on to something and you have a character and you can understand the sort of logic of it. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. So reading it all in one go or in the, spread out over time, I don't think it makes a lot of difference, really. Mm -hmm. Did you, mm -hmm. Have you felt that you could get into the kind of rhythm of mind of, of the narrator in, in the book? Well, I saw your comment about it. And so I was paying attention to rhythm as I read forward. And I did feel that it sort of... Um, it moves from that beginning space that a that a story has it, in about the first fifteen chapters or so, then it takes on its rhythm. And I felt that in the reading forward from chapter twenty four, you did find a, a rhythm that was not so evident in the first chapters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um. I want, I, want, I want to ask how, how we might conduct this call because we, mm. we're not through the whole novel. We're, I'm halfway through, Jeffrey, halfway through, Donna, maybe a quarter mm. of the way through. Mm. And, um, and at, you know, at the, so the, it's, hard, it's hard to have a, a holistic perspective you know, on it. Mm. Uh, and not that, you know, one could, or I would want to stand back and, you know, judge it or, uh, mm. or something like that. But, uh, you know, any work of art has to be absorbed and digested and metabolized, mm. you know, through, through, um, through one's own psyche. Mm. Uh, and it feels that, you know, we're, 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 in, it's a work in progress. We're, we're in the middle of this reading process. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it also, you know, it connects to other other things that we're reading and to other mm. processes. Just before you mm. got on the call, Donna, Jeffrey and I were talking about the all the reading that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Because we've been reading Sloterdijk, Peter Sloterdijk, um, uh, Aaron Manning, uh, various papers or essays uh, for Cosmos Cafe, reading mm. this. We're planning to read uh, Sri Aurobindo 
uh, the, you know, his full magnum opus, The Life Divine. Uh, and it, like, it, it can be hard, I think, to move between these different voices because they're, they're all mm -hmm. strong voices and they all have a particular wor in a way of world that they open up. Uh, when mm -hmm. I'm reading this novel, uh, what has been happening for me is that I feel like I'm being transported into into this into this world of the you know, Chinese landscape, the rural life of of the the, very, the villagers and their beliefs and their magical you know, practices and the author's observations and and you know, everything that's really encoded in and being transmitted through through the work. Um, it has this kind of background mood to it and an attunement. Uh, so I, I can't just read it kind of on, very quickly uh, on the go. I can't just absorb or extract like, information from it in the way that I can with a theoretical work, like a work of philosophy. Sloterdijk is a little bit in between because he's sort of a literary philosopher. But when I read theoretical work, I can extract a schema of understanding about what the author is saying, what is their particular model or their idea, etc. And one of the qualities I think of of, of this work, Soul Mountain, and of, I mean, if a fiction in general, but I think that there's something peculiar or particular about uh, Gao Jingjian Zhen's uh, fiction and and the the state of mind that he's expressing in this text, which is coming. In, particular pla place in his life um it has a one has i think I, I have to attune to it i have to attune to mm -hmm. it and i have to kind of dream with it uh mm -hmm. and uh, and i can't uh what i was reflecting on as we were approaching this call and i looked at your list jeffrey of the key words that um for you uh that, you know were salient in each in each chapter and as I was reviewing the text and the things I've underlined or different notes that I've I've made, what I was reflecting on is the fact that I, I didn't know what I didn't know what to say about it. I didn't know I didn't even I wasn't even sure what had happened. Uh, it was hard to remember, uh, like the the episodes and and I mean they were they're, they're, I, if I look if I start reading the the text again I can enter back into the. A particular episode, a dialogue with the the female the female person, or um, interaction with the, the villager, the ranger, or sign, the, the, all the various things that happen, I can enter back into them. But like as as if coming out of a dream, I find it difficult to recall them all and piece them together. And I wondered why that you know I wondered about that. Um, maybe that is just poor memory on, on my part, but. I think also it has to, I don't think my memory is that bad. And I think it also has to do with state of mind and attunement and mood. And when I've felt myself to be over the past you know, couple of weeks, kind of floating with uh, the author's wanderings and his experiences, uh, it's like you said, Jeffrey, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really trying to piece together so much of picture of what's happening although in my mind I'm, i am i do have a map and i'm trying to imagine where he's traveling to because he names the names of different locations and mountains and rivers and so on so uh i have a sort of geographical a crude geographical um aspect to my um to my experience of the text but um i'm really interested in what i find what i think is most meaningful to me um, so far, is is precisely this attitude or mood that the that the author is in, because it's so contrary to the digital type of experience, to theory, philosophy, to certainly to you know politics and the news. And he really in he understands himself to be an author of what he calls exile, uh, except it, it doesn't that may not be the right the uh, an adequate translation. Uh, in I've also seen the word fleeing, and in this book he's he's left he's he's a, he's left his uh, life uh, behind in, in in the city 
he's left the literary world, he's left his relationships, and he's wandering alone, really, really allowing uh, uh, the the current the, the currents of life to to take him where 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 it goes, and then and then he's writing about that, and um, it's awakened in me a kind of almost a nostalgia for that sense of freedom uh, i think there's a sense of freedom mm. in 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 his um in his mind his mind state uh but it's not it's not freedom from uh you know suffering or from being afraid or from making mistakes or from passion or like that's what's is coming like all the stuff of life right that he's encountering is is what is allowed to take shape uh, in his experience. And then as a writer, he records that. Uh, and I've, I've been listening to some interviews with, uh, with the author and trying to find um, doc, you know, documentary uh, videos or anything like that. There's, not, there's almost nothing in English. He, spoke, he speaks French, so there are some interviews in French. Uh, and I found also a talk by the translator, uh, Mabel Lee, uh, giving an overview uh, of uh, the author's work and, and life and, and um, his, his, I don't want to say his philosophy, but his, his, way, of, his way of writing, his, his, way, his, his understanding of what he's doing. Uh, it's making me reflect on what I'm doing as a writer uh, and where my priorities are, how I feel I'm p relating to uh, you know, the kind of the given world, uh, like the, the, the social world that we're in and the economic world. So he is a painter too, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at his works, they're, they're black and white, they're like water ink, watercolors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're very nuanced in the sense of shading. You, you could you could sense that in some of the descriptions of the landscapes that that he gives in the book, uh, like the the uh, chapter sixteen, the mountain, and the way that it emerges mm -hmm. from the blackness, and there's a faint outline of it, and uh, that kind of distant, impenetrable intimacy of the of the of the darkness is is and the form coming out of darkness um i see that in his in his paintings work as well but i'm just getting to, to know him it's like a whole another it's a whole person you know and <laughs> it's like getting to know you know a person a person their their mind their way of seeing the world and um i'm i i'm, appre I'm appreciating that that it's, it's slowing me down and also, I got, I'm a little bit sick. I, got, I woke up with a sore throat yesterday, and uh, I've been feeling overwhelmed as well with the different readings that we're doing and mm -hmm. everything that I want to do and accomplish you know, in, in my life in, through this Cosmos project and in all areas of it. And um, this is somebody who who's, has a completely contrasting experience in this book because he's let go of his life. Uh, and the experience of finishing this book for him, what, what prompted the completion of the book, he, had, he had, uh, had been writing it for seven years, had done all this traveling. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think he ended up in France. I may not have the details correct yeah. on that point, but, mm. but the Tiananmen Square incident is what <clears throat> made him realize that he would never go back to China. And so he decided to finish the book and start a new life. In, in France. And so, um, the, the notion that, you know, one's life is a finite thing in a way. You can have a kind of life after your life. And um, maybe this book is the record of like a transition from one life to another, from his life in China to his life in, in the West. Um, it's making me just reflect on where I am in my life and, you know, how, the, how that will inevitably change in some way, at some point, and how maybe I, I, what I really want too. I don't know.
you know, I, I like this freedom. <laughs> I, I like, I like, I like, like the wandering mind. I like to, uh, and I've, in my life, I've done a little bit of that kind of travel, but I was younger and I didn't have the kind of perspective that, that, um, that the narr- narr- narrator does here. Uh, and, you know, at the same time, I'm not in China. Um, my life is good. Uh, I have a beautiful family. I have all the amenities I need. I have, I have the mountains too. I could go wandering up into the mountains if I want to in, in Colorado. And, and I bet they're somewhat similar. And, and you know, I'm, I don't think there are any shamans up there. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, what, what is the life of a writer? I, th- I think that Gal, he raised this question and, um, but not theoretically. I think he raises it just through the example of his own life and his work. So I'm, I'm, I'm really get, appreciating getting to know it. And uh, I started drawing. I'll show you something. <laughs> this was just earlier today because I wanted to, um, I got this brand new notebook, a sketchbook. Yeah. And I'm not a visual artist. I really can't, you know, make, but this is the Chinese uh, Ling Shan. Uh huh. I try. So I don't write Chinese, speak Chinese, never took a lesson in Chinese, but I copied it to see what, why is, mm-hmm. why is the thought move this way? And mm-hmm. um, that's all. I'm very, very much in the middle of that. I'm in the act, thought in the act. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, so many ideas. Wow. It makes me like feel like, yeah, I have to go back and read. The reason why I didn't uh, read many chapters or finish many chapters is that I felt this book needs that I have to be in a really um, a special mindset, you know. I just felt this is not just a book or a novel that I can just take it and read it quickly, like in an assignment and see what's going on, what's happening and the plot and this and that. I felt this is a a book that I have to be ready to read it because I felt it's like it's a spiritual journey. And I am now so much involved in this reality I'm living now in deadlines, uh, things to finish and I felt once I finish everything and then I can take this book, it's like a sacred text, you know, and you have to just go through it. Because the first page, when I read the first page, reaching a station, a bus station, we always want, I mean, I felt myself, I always want a station somewhere that I reach this station and then from on forward, I would take this journey. And I just, when I started reading, I mean, the narrator and this character, one of the characters in one of my short stories, he's he's in exile, but in his hometown, in a city. I don't know if you can say it's one of those characters out of modernity. And he just takes this journey during the night in a city where he felt that he's not familiar anymore. And it's it's totally different from the journey here. And then it made me reflect, I mean, why my character was so, so in exile and why his journey didn't give him this sense that I felt the narrator is feeling here. So, I mean, for me, it's really, it was very interesting to contrast of, and to talk to my characters and to feel my characters, as you said, as a writer, and to see why my character, is it because of the geography? Is China different from the geography I'm living? Am I reflecting characters living in this geography? In my geography is, I mean, China and this soul mountain. Do we have a soul mountain? Should I look for a soul mountain? You know, so many things, you know. And last night I was talking to a friend of mine who is, you know, writing um, a series for TV anthology. And he was telling me he wants to take this journey. So funny. I mean, to take from north of Jordan down to south and through these villages. And he he wants to try, you know, to link the mythology that we have, the, the, the stories that old people tells and 
and how this journey would change characters. And I was like, wow, tomorrow I'm going to have this <laughs> conversation. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I mean, That's sometimes, you know, signs, you have signs. And, but yeah, I felt, I mean, every morning I take the book and I want to start reading it and I say, no, this book, you sh- I shouldn't read it like, you know, skim it quickly. Yeah, I have to finish it because I felt no, because I took my time in the first chapters. Um, it's not easy. I mean, he has written it out of his experience. And I think for me, out of respect, I should give it its, you know, its time and I should read it carefully. And yeah, I feel that this is a man who has took his time writing this book. Hmm. Yeah, these are my reflections. I mean, so far. I, I concur. I feel that too. Mm. That there's a different time in the book. Mm-hmm. And d- I think he is deliberately mm. seeking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, if, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, no. I mean, even the language when I was reading, I was wondering always, how is it in Chinese? You know, I just felt, how is it? How would it be in Chinese? I mean, you know, I'm reading the translation and it's beautiful from one chapter to the other. And then I thought, how is it in Chinese, you know? I have the same curiosity. And ah. I, I got the idea, maybe I should order the book or something. or Because I, I like Chinese is Chinese to me. Mm. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> and I'm very curious. It has made me curious. Uh, mm. Very curious. Um, and it's so... Anyway, I don't want to be too naive about it either, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, because, you know, I've watched a few Chinese films and I always had this feeling, I mean, maybe it's my ignorance, that the language might be like Arabic, you know, a bit formal and rigid. But when I read this, this novel, I felt, no, it's completely different from what I had, the idea I had, you know, based on films I watched. So I, I, I've never, I, I studied Mandarin, written Mandarin for a year, but I was, at the end of a year, I was only able to decipher a little bit headlines. That was it. <laughs> 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 and then I put it to one side. So I, it's very, it's very difficult to make progress. <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, I, I, I relate to your, comments marco about its ineffable its difficulty to grasp that's partly why i wrote the 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 titles because i got to what i think i got to about the chapter 13 or 14 i said i have no idea what i read and so i started to go back decide try and pull out these these one or two word poetic images that kind of characterize the chapter and and then i kept going doing that it gave me a trace of the journey, uh, but I stopped trying to think it through at that point. I just, you know, I just because I kind of enjoyed the exercise of trying to trying to read through a chapter and try to figure out what is the image that speaks the most from this chapter, um, and so I sort of enjoyed that exercise. Um, one of the things that I found in the reading, so I I, I don't know if you you folk have read other texts from Chinese or Chinese related writings. So I've read, uh, there's a series of books. They're not written by a Chinese person. They're written by a, a, um, a Dutch sinologist uh, who lived and worked in China. Uh, and it's a series of 17 books, which are detective books that take place in seventh century China. Uh, the the author's name is Robert Van Gulik. And so, anyway, so I've read all those books. What's interesting is there are many elements in the this book that are like echoes of Van Gulik's book, even though Van Gulik is describing events that happened 14 centuries previously. And right? so here you have this sort of lineage a historical lineage inside the Chinese culture that is so so deep um, so a lot of the 
you know, like for instance, at one point in one of the chapters I've just been reading, he talked. They, there's this talk about the fox lady or, or the fox uh, woman, uh, and the fox woman is a character talked about in the Van Gulik books. Uh, so it's this idea of a changeling kind of uh, character or, or, or spirit or people who take on the appearance of of foxes or who change into foxes or, and these people move through the landscape. So there's a lot of these um, spirit or changeling or, or magic elements um, in, in the, in the, in the traditional Chinese writing. Van Gulik, his stories were based on actual detective stories that were, were written in that era but then he modernized them for a Western audience is what he did. And so, so there are many elements that actually date from or that are pulled out of Chinese writings and then presented somewhat differently. But um, so I do find these echoes interesting. And one of the things I've noticed in the reading in this last section of reading. So at first it wasn't clear to me, the mountain you get early on, but the soul part wasn't so clear. It seemed to me that it was a lot of wandering and day-to-day -day life, but why was it called Soul Mountain? Why is the book called Soul Mountain? And now in the text, it's I find it's coming in more and more. Many of the chapters are dealing with, like the, there was a chapter, I can't remember which one, that deals with, Buddhists and a Buddhist experience. There's other ones that deal with, there's a lot that deal with um, w women's uh, menstruation, uh, these kinds of issues, which are clearly a spiritual reference. There's things dealing with the, um, the, the sort of God of things that is characteristic of traditional Chinese cultures. And so, and, and the story, and about darkness, you mentioned that, Marco, the, the role of darkness, which is another element that I find really interesting. So there's a lot of echoes that are, so I, I'm not sure where it's going, but I do find the echoes and the resonances and the, and the, and the references really interesting. Mm. So it does feel like it is beginning to gather into something as opposed mm. to just wander as it felt with in the earlier parts of the book. Mm -hmm. I've, I, I, I noted it's uh, intensification and I think that mm. It ha one of the axes of that sense of things gathering is the relationship between the 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 I or the for the you the I you uh, the first person in, in the book and the the she the the woman. There's a story uh, emerging. We're we're learning something about her life story, and at the same time that we're witnessing uh, these scenes you know, from their relationship with each other and the, the kind of back and forth dialogue that they have and this, this, game, this kind of game that they're playing with each other. But it's a sort of high stakes game, it seems. And I, I don't know exactly what to make of it yet. I don't even know if it's real yet. Uh, um, he seems to have really met this person, uh, but a lot of the dialogue and a lot of what happens might be his fantasy. It, but sometimes it seems like it, it is. And one of the one of their um, one of their games, one of their lovers' games, uh, is to tell stories, uh, and and he will tell these tall tales. He'll make make things up, but he also seems to have a, lot, a wealth of knowledge about the local uh, legends and customs, and you know these kinds of stories that might show up in a medieval detective Chinese detective novel. I, see, I think I think he's coming into a world where the time hasn't actually passed, um, or, or rather, where there's a kind of 
there, there's a fracture in time. Uh, the, the old world is still there, but the you know through the the 20th century, the, the wars, the cultural revolution, uh, it, it's, it's being broken apart. Uh, and I mean, p- part of what I think what the point of his novel is, or why he wanted to do it, the political aspect you could say of the novel was specifically to draw attention to the aspects of of tradition of ancient Chinese culture, but not just Chinese because it's different peoples and right? different different groups and the Qian, the, Qian, uh, the Ma- Mayo, uh, various others, uh, which ha- are distinct even with their own language, their own dialects, and it's, it seems important to retell the stories, uh, to salvage them even from the, um, you know, what, what we know from historically was the, you know, the violent attempt to, to you know, suppress or erase uh, all, all that culture. Um, but what we see in the novel as well, in the, the interactions with the, you know, the different bureaucrats and the land management um, issues, um, the, you know, the, there was that episode with the bus driver, uh, and the, um, the red armband, uh, police or whatever they were. Uh, and, and, and so, I mean, I'm kind of, uh, a bit, um, what's the word, but just flummoxed or I'm not finding the right word, but my head is spinning a bit with all these stories, the, uh, you know the, the 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 guy that the drum maker who's sacrificing animals, uh, and you know is goes crazy at the end and dies. Uh, but it's one after the other, and they're 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 so. Um, there's one there's one point in the book where, and I'd like maybe even to find the quote where he, where he says this is real. He's reflecting on his own. And it's early in the book, right? He's reflecting on the fact that he's in that moment having a conversation with this person. There's a fire. Uh, the sparks, the embers from the fire are real. And it becomes a kind of uh, spooky, almost. Um, I, I'm going to try to find it since we can. Mm, I, I remember it, this one, I think, at the beginning. Yeah. It's, it's two, mm. two, chapter two. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. But there are lots of spooky segments, actually, though. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's, there, there's, uh, he gets lost in, he, lo- he loses track of his guide in the mountains. He, he has that, wanders off from the monastery and, um, you know, loses track of where, where, where the pathway is. Um, for this, for the sake of, just to bring in some of the text, I'll read the first paragraph. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. It is in the Kiang region, halfway up Kyonglai Mountain, in the border areas of the Qinghai Tibetan Highlands and the Sichuan Basin, that I witness a vestige of early human civilization, the worship of fire. Fire, the bringer of civilization, has been worshipped by the early ancestors of human beings everywhere. It is sacred. The old man is sitting in front of the fire drinking liquor from a bowl. Before each sip, he puts a finger into it and flicks some on the charcoals, which splutter noisily and send out blue sparks. It is only then that I perceive that I, too, am real. And, uh, and then there's the story about Grandpa Stone. Mm-hmm. That, uh, the hunter, the, these few yeah. stories come in. Mm, that was a beautiful chapter, actually. There's another paragraph here. I, I highlighted it earlier. He's talking about leaving his life in the city. He says, in those contaminated surroundings, I was taught that life was the source of literature, that literature had to be faithful to life, faithful to real life. My mistake was that I had alienated myself from life and ended up turning my back on real life. Life is not the same as manifestations of life. Real life, or in other words, the basic substance of life, should be the former and not the latter. So I don't know what manifestations of life 
hour, but uh, I had gone against real life because I was simply stringing together life's manifestations. So, of course, I wasn't able to accurately portray life. And in the end, only succeeding in distorting reality. And then he talks about how he doesn't know whether he's succeeding, but he's, he's here. He, he extricated himself. Um, mm. Yeah, the point, the point about literature, actually, now I'm in this chapter, I felt that he's just contemplating, um, should literature be faithful to life? Or, I mean, writers, poets, especially poetry, I mean, how faithful in depicting life. Everybody is trying to explain life, but you feel that, literature is not you know or 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 in a way depicting life reality the real life what we're facing i don't know it was really yeah yeah or or should literature change life change reality and it always kept me wondering when i was reading these chapters did this journey really happen or I don't know. Is it a dream? Is it reality? Or distorting his reality? I'm still, I mean, I can't say because I didn't reach half of the novel yet. But it made me wonder from the beginning, is this journey really happening? Does he exist? He doesn't have a name. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't have a name at all. He's a pronoun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, then, but then again, we are pronouns. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the shifting pronouns is also part of why it's hard to remember. Because we're con the ground is, the ground that we're reading, the way we're reading it, the, the point of view that we have to adopt is constantly mm -hmm. around it. Mm -hmm. It's quite disconcerting in a way, I think. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, an excerpt that I picked up. I think it's in um, one of the, the later ones, but it's related to what you're talking about too. Whether berries wait for people or people wait for berries is a metaphysical problem. There are many ways of dealing with the problem and it has been dealt with in endless ways, but the berries are still berries and the person is still me. One could also say this year's berries are not next year's berries, and the person existing today did not exist yesterday. The problem is whether or not the present really exists and how the criteria are established. Best leave it to the philosophers to talk about metaphysics and just keep your mind on walking along your road. Wow. <laughs> The lesson there, bro. <laughs> so, Jeffrey, you mentioned uh, you you got a little stuck with your own writing at one point recently, and something about this book jogged your process. Yeah, yeah it's it's the use of the second person pronoun. So, uh, in one of my books, I tried to, to write from second person, and I. I, it, it was complete failure, but the same. But the third book in that in that trilogy, by the same characters, kind of called for another another attempt at it. And so I found that having read this book, he enters in. There's a kind of a way he has of dealing with the second person, which I find uh, compelling. Um, it, 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 you know, it's not an easy tense to write, uh, point of view to write, and yet, um, and, and he doesn't use it only that. He switches between he and she and you and I, and so that's another way to break, because break, I think if you had, well, I kind of feel if you had only you and I, it would be, become difficult, but that if you break it up with another point of view, it it somehow makes it a little bit easier from a reading perspective. But I do find this, um, he's constantly addressing the you. 
and um, and so I started to incorporate his way of doing that into my writing, and it kind of works. So for the moment, it's moving forward. <laughs> Who is the you in in your book? So in my book, so in my book, it's a an exchange between two characters and the main character met the the other character very early in her life as a young girl and um you know became fascinated with the older character and but he rejects her and so later on in life they meet again but because she has this memory about that first encounter she's not inclined to give him any kind of uh, benefit of the doubt or, and, and so it starts off with a very sharp, angry kind of uh, uh, relationship between them and develops from there. And so why it works is because in the first time I tried it, he was absent. He was just a memory, but now he's, now they're constantly interchanging with each other. And so mm-hmm. when she says you, she means the person she's actually engaging with. And so it has a much, it has much more of a presence to it. Now, mm-hmm. Gao doesn't do it this way exactly, because in a way he's, you is actually a memory or I don't know, is it a real person that comes back to this thing of, is, is he, is you really there or is it, but it seems to be a kind of, uh, <laughs> like you said, Marco, a kind of uh, a story in itself, the UI, which is different from the he, she story. Um, so, but I'm not saying I'm copying him. I'm just saying that there's something about the way that he approaches that use of the pronoun that kind of works for me. So. You're muted, uh, Marco. I was, I was directing uh, to, to, to Donna and uh, mm. asking who who you think the you is in this book. I mean, I, I'm still in the first chapter, but I mean, I don't know if my idea is correct. When I was reading the you and I, I felt the you is an alter ego of the I. I don't know if I'm right. I'm still reading, you know, but it gave me that sense that the you is an extension of the I or is the alter ego or is the mirror that the I want to face. I mean, I don't know. These are my impressions. Maybe I'm wrong because this is based because now when Jeffrey was talking, I was just thinking about my characters. When I write, I'm always afraid to explore the you. In my stories, there is always the I. And when Jeffrey was saying that he has a you in his writing, I was just thinking, why not to explore a you in one of my... I'm always afraid to give a voice to a you or a he or she. It's like as if I want the perspective or the... I'm selfish. Maybe I'm selfish that my character is always I, is always dominant in my writings. But then I was thinking how Jeffrey is telling how about the you, and I felt maybe I should experiment in the you land more and more. And not to think of it as the you, like I thought for in this novel, is part of the I. Because I always, in my universe that I create, there is only the I, and everything is part of the I. Hmm. What I found is that the you it gives an intensity, it gives a kind of an intimate intensity to the uh, to the exchange, to the, the, that this dialogue between you and I, there's an, there's an intensity and it's intimate, and mm. and and the book that I'm writing is about that intensity and that intimacy, and that's why it seems to fit. Um, mm. In Gao's book, I find that um, I'm not sure that I think there are times when you feel that the you is an extension of the I. But it seems to me at other times the, the you slides into something else. 
uh, I can't, I, I'd have to actually dig out the passages, and I don't think I have them referenced that way, but uh, uh, certainly in some of the recent ones where he's talking about um, violent incidences about women, uh, the you seems to be somewhat different from just another I. But I. Hmm. Mm. I mean, I was just trying to think that you, at the beginning, because I'm still in the first chapters, I thought maybe the you is younger self from the I. The I is the older self and telling the story from a different time and talking to the you like when you talk to the your younger self. I mean, I don't know. I'm still reading the first chapters, but these are my impressions at the beginning. But then again, maybe it's totally completely two different characters. I mean, I have to go through the novel to to go through the journey. I mean, to 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 see if it's there is a you and a and there is an a, and I. Marco, what do you think? <laughs> well, I, I noticed that. <laughs> When I read the sections that are in the um, the second person perspective, the you perspective, that I feel as the reader, as the one who's uh, experiencing the language, the flow of the language, I feel that I'm observing. I feel that, that I'm observing the, the character and describing to the character what uh, is going on for them. And sometimes, so, so I, I feel that the you, the, the you is, I don't want to character might not be the right word, but subject might not be the right word. I mean, we, we don't quite have perhaps the exact philosophical like, category for it. But who is speaking, I think, when the speech is in the form of a, a you address is a sort of, a, I think, an observer that is, they're watching what's happening, watching what the I, the uh, you know, the narrator is experiencing, and then uh, commenting on it and describing it, commenting, and, and even directly addressing that that character. It's 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 alt, maybe alter ego. Um, there's an or alter alter observer. Um, Uh, the, there's one more th th thing to that, and, and that's that Gao is also a playwright, <clears throat> and uh, he has directed some of his own plays, uh, uh, and has also you know worked with he works directly with actors. So um, I was learning a little bit about that through one of the interviews that that, that I um, watched or listened to. And so, so I, I can imagine that the you is almost like a form of stage, almost like a form of direction, where the, the director persona the, is directing the car, the, the player, uh, who is taking this journey, who's visiting these locations and meeting these people and pursuing experiences. Uh, th there's some kind of a, 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 a um, almost like a. a and maybe it doesn't happen directly, but there's a, a way that somebody's orchestrating it. And this, and it's not the you who's orchestrating, but the one who's saying you, the one who's taking mm -hmm. that perspective is the one that is um, guiding maybe this, this, and maybe not only guiding, because also mm -hmm. reflecting back, maybe critiquing in a certain way, the, 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 um, the experiences of this person. Sometimes the I does something kind of dumb or gets into a conflict, gets into an argument, uh, like the case with, uh, with the, when he got stranded, uh, in the, so you don't, you didn't get to this point yet, Donna, but, uh, there's an episode where, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the where Gao or the, who have, is, um, on a bus that gets, that gets stopped by the military, pol the, the police and not even the police, just some officials. And then he gets into an argument with the bus driver who ends up drinking because he's gotten a big fine. And, uh, and I don't remember, I'd have to go back to whether or not that's written in the you perspective, but I could see that mm. narrator 
almost te- like show reflecting back what was experienced in order for the per- the, the individual to learn from it to, to not make mm-hmm. that same mistake again mm-hmm. uh, so th- just mm-hmm. some mm-hmm. thoughts on, mm-hmm. on what that m- what might be going on there I, I've I have used the you in my in writing poetry mm-hmm. and in the in, in in the case of a couple of pieces that come to mind, which um, I haven't shared, uh, there's uh, there's either I'm I'm speaking to myself, I'm either addressing myself, and, and it's a it's a conversation between me and myself, and I'm addressing myself as a you, or I'm I'm speaking to a kind of cultural you. And the sort of pattern that I see in, in, in my peers, in us. And I address mm-hmm. that as you, uh, as an alternative or a more direct way of saying we. Uh, I, I, I don't think that that's what Gao's doing here. I think the you is himself. And who, who, what is his, his self? That's, that's, I mean, that's, I think, the, the, the big, mm-hmm. that's the question. That's a, that's a good question. So- so you think the you is Gao himself? I mean, who's addressing you? I, this actually, when you mention it now, it's bewildered me. Now, the first chapter we have I. I is Gao or is the narrator or is the, ca- the main character or what? And then you have you. Is I addressing you or is it the narrator addressing you or is it us, the readers, we're addressing you or... Is it Gao? I mean, I was so, I was just, it's like bewildering, you know, when I was reading, who is, who is addressing you? And then again, you go back, who is addressing I? And then I remembered like Foucault's article, what is an author when he mentioned Beckett, what does it matter who's speaking? And then I said, okay, fine, then I should read it. What does it matter who's speaking? Uh, yeah, I, I, I uh, that specific article didn't come to mind, but that phrase that there's an essay that Foucault wrote. What does it, what does it matter? Who, is that the name of the essay? Uh, the main, the name. Uh, what is an author? What is an author? Yeah, it's like uh, based on um, death of the author. It's mm-hmm. it's in a way he took it to a further dimension than what Ronald ba- uh, Bart. I, yeah. I think yeah, death I of read, the author. I read it in college. Mm. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Oh, I've I learned in college. Yes. <laughs> but I wonder, just another possibility, the you could be us, the reader. Yes. And in a way, directing us. Mm. I in felt that. I mean, I felt this is very smart from him, you know. I felt that also. Well, you you said, Donna, that you your characters also are going on journeys. Mm. But that the geography is different, uh, the pronoun is different. Mm-hmm. What, what are the, what's the quality of the journey that your characters are going on? Well, uh, it's a journey of nothing makes sense, um, leading a purposeless life. It's, you know, when you come out of like the wasteland, when you come out of this atmosphere of this you as a self, as an I, that you do not know who you are, what you're doing. It's, yeah, yeah, these are most of the journeys and it goes back and forth. The times and going back to a different past, coming back to a present moment and reflecting and and the journeys differs one during the night, another one during on the way to a grave, being buried and being going to be, you know, a character going to his grave on the way, the journey going back to childhood and thinking and reflecting and wondering and people around this character having nonsense talks. Yeah. I mean, it differs. Each one, each story differs, and another one from a perspective of a young child. But it's always I. 
That's why it made me wonder. I, I, I mean, I don't know why I was afraid of exploring the you. Hmm. Well, I don't think it's easy to write from the you perspective. So. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you travel within your country or around? Yes, I traveled to different countries even, not just, I mean, I didn't stay in one location. Yes, definitely. I, I traveled to different countries and lived in, lived in different countries. But it's, I don't know, it's maybe reflections of characters I've met or a past life, something like that, in a dream. Yeah. Do you write about the places you go to? Uh, not really. The place does not, uh, I mean, it's not important for me, the place mm. when I write. Mm. Yeah. So I don't describe Yeah. Yeah, the landscape or the geography of the place. Place has always been, I mean, even borders and places and geography has never meant anything to me. Mm. That's interesting. And, and Jeffrey is writing a <laughs> science fiction novel that takes place in a completely alternate universe. So oh, wow. This is a whole nother kind of place. Oh, wow. And place is critical for me because if you, because they're, you know, because they're future spaces. So you, hmm. I feel that people need to understand the place in which the action, ha the things happen because the place in a sense gives the character of what's going on. So. I work hard on my places. Mm. Do you have uh, like local legends and, um, you know, cultural practices? Yes, definitely, definitely. I mean, we have written the first epic that ever human beings written, oh, no, no, Gilgamesh. I'm talking about you personally. Or ah! you no, I was talking about Jeffrey. See, this is the oh, parallels of the you. <laughs> yes, no, I understand. Who is Mark, please, Marco, is, please define who is the you. <laughs> ancient civilization. There is uh, an I. We, I think each one of us should take a you, an I, and a he or a she. Yeah. I'll be the she. Okay. <laughs> so what was the question, Marco? Well, uh, well, I mean, what part of what is so, I think, compelling about, about this book is that it's, it's so rich in lore in this local folk lore, folk customs. Like he's, he's a, although he's an amateur, he's a scholar uh, of, um, of, of cultures. And it seems that although he doesn't talk about doing research, he does a lot of research, a lot of reading, um, interviews. Uh, he, he, he's not just traveling like a, like a, like a tourist. Um, like he's really engaging in all the places that, that he goes. And, part of what he's seeking in the soul that he's seeking, he's fine. He's looking for in, in the places that he goes to, uh, at least partly, right? B because there's some aspect of himself that is, he's working through, he's remembering his life. He's having, remembering his great grand stories, even of his great grandfather and, uh, his, his, um, his father. Uh, and so, I mean, to me, it was, I've had a, a kind of experience in my life where uh, I, I had a, this sort of communion with a place and where I went to seek some aspect of, of myself. And I don't know if I want to talk all about it, um, but it was a different kind of writing. It was a, the kind of writing that I did in the way that I conducted my life when I was looking to the people around me and the place that, that I was the places that I was in. And I also traveled kind of in the mountains and this is in central, central America. Um, that's where I was finding my, my soul. That was my, that was where I was finding the, the reflections of, of the self that I, I was seeking. And, you know, coming after the cultural revolution and the, the, the you know, the, the, in the state of being an exile, I, I feel that what, what Gao is, is is doing is finding his soul in in the in the place the places that he goes to in the very local specific particular um, parts of it uh, and 
you know, th- there's, there's, there's another aspect to his, um, per, his stance or his way of doing this, which I think is interesting. And, and that's the way that he conceives of the writer in relation to society. Uh, he doesn't have a program. Like there is no self to achieve for him. I think in this book, like in the sense of a, a career or, um, you know, publications. Uh, I mean, one other aspect of this, you know, of, of, of the writing of this book that he communicated and that I think is, you know, comes through is that he says he was writing it for himself. And so if, if you're writing, and I don't know, is that, I don't know whether or not to believe him exactly, because I imagine that almost every writer, even if they're writing for themselves, even if they're not trying to please an audience or a publisher, or, or you, you dream of other people reading your work eventually. You dream of it getting, being in the world. Um, and, you know, it, but in, in this case, he doesn't, you know, he's at least entered into a state of mind in this journey which probably you know, maybe changes after he gets to France, but he's entering into a state of mind where he's not seeking himself in that same sense. He's, he's seeking himself in, in the world around him and in what he call, calls real life, which he said that he cut himself off from. And um, that, I, 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 that, that speaks to me because sometimes I feel like am I, I'm cutting myself off, myself off from real life in some way. Like there's things happening around me all the time. I have my family. I have two girls who are constantly doing different things. I can walk out my door and wander, wander around the city, meet people, talk to people. There is a whole world around me. And am I, why, why, why am I not being where I am? Why am I not uh, opening uh, my experience to what's most present, what's, mo- what's, what's least about an uh, abstract goal or an abstract I- you know, idea of what I, what I should be? Um, I mean, that may be a fruitless line of thought because at the end of the day, I have to integrate them some, in some way. Uh, and there's no kind of escape uh, exactly that I'm, I'm going to take. Um, but the idea that the writer really shouldn't try to change the world, really shouldn't even try to, to achieve something, um, that the, the writer really is just there to, to describe, to, to tell the, the, what they see, what they experience, and give a te- a t- uh, some kind of um, testimony to their existence, to their experience. I have to. That's very compelling to me. I don't know how to live that way. But you don't really think that that's what she's done. I mean, the, uh, there's a lot of artifice in the book. It's not just. I mean, the choices that he's made there their intentional choices because you didn't have to write the book this way. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it's, I think it may present itself as something kind of ad libbed almost as it, but it's, I don't think that's what's going on. Hmm. I, I agree about the artifice. I mean, I, I and uh, he has said that he deliberately is using different techniques. He's drawing on uh, modern Western writers, on ancient Chinese authors. And he's he's ex- deliberately constructing this book in a, in a certain way. So there is the construction of the book, you know, the seven years of writing and whatever he, there, I imagine there must be a lot more notes he took and drawings and all kinds of things that form the kind of raw impressions of these experiences that he had. I mean, one other aspect, one other thing I think we could be clear on is that it is autobiographical. At least that's what 
he said, that's what the translator has said. I don't know how much weight to put on that because really it's not autobiographical in the sense of the, that we understand an autobiography as a linear you know, narration of the events of one's life. But it's, um, I, I, mean, I know there are places where he's making things up, but I, I have a kind of faith that he's also, that he's also telling what happened in the, in the way that's true for him. And that even though it's a construction, a literary creation, there's real life that is being described. And that, that, that that's the, like, that's really what he was, he's artistically um, transmitting or portraying. Um, but it's real, it's real. <laughs> that's so, that, that's, that's where I wonder, like, around how a writer, you know, how a writer understands themselves, like what they're really doing. You know? comes to the discussion we're having with um, Zachary or Johnny about their writing, because uh, much of their writing is very autobiograph- autobiographical. And so, um, in fact, uh, I was talking to a friend the other day, and she was saying, oh, Jeffrey, you should really think about writing something autobiographical. And I thought, huh, I'm not sure I would go there, you know, because it's, it's there's a, there's getting the distance right in terms of not being too close and not being too far and I don't know I don't I don't really know how to do that but and I admire people who do that you know like Zachary or Johnny but um, so but Gal's book his book I'm not sure that I take it as being autobiographical in the same sense than what Zachary or 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 Johnny are doing. I think this is. Um, I think there is a point here. I think this is a journey that he is taking us on, and the journey is designed to take us somewhere. So I don't think it's a strict retelling of the things. I mean, I'm not saying I doubt that he didn't make those voyages. I think he did, and they did make those observations, as you say. He has copious notes from all the traveling that he did. But I don't think the story the way it presents itself to us, does it even follow the chronology of the voyages he makes? I mean, does the movement from one place to the next follow the actual movements he made through the landscape? I'm not at all convinced that's the case. I don't think so either. And, And there's something with the woman too. I think he really met her. It seems that he did. But I don't know whether he had all these encounter these later encounters which come much later in the novel where he's already in different locations and it doesn't seem that she's gone with him and, and it seems like there's more than one she because he talks about the woman and you're not always sure that he's talking about the same woman yes because sometimes the background details seem to differ from one she to another so that's right there's a lot that comes up donna in the next chapters mm-hmm. that, that you'll read, which I think um, you know, are, great, are very interesting from the perspective of the relationship mm-hmm. between the man and the woman mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. sexual politics and sexual dynamics mm-hmm. and that kind of a thing. I, it would be you know, interesting to discuss that, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, there's a lot of politics in here too. It's very subtle, mm-hmm. but it, you know, it's, not out, it's not outright mm-hmm making arguments against mm. the communist party or, or, or what have mm. you, but the, more in the sense of the minor gesture that um, we're, we're, another book we're reading is called the minor gesture by Erin Manning. And the minor mm. gesture is she contrasts to the major kind of, you know, big plan. Uh, minor gesture is more, doesn't look to be um, confrontation. It doesn't look to be, uh, um, you know, to fit into the, the way that, discourse is supposed to happen so there, there, there's a lot here that where he i think he's making critiques of chinese society uh and um things like you know gender relations definitely you know the the, the relation between government and, and the people uh that um i think are you know i i think would be interesting to discuss because um uh, well, we have you'd have to read. It. <laughs> we'll we'll yeah, have to yeah. do it next time. We'll have to do it next time. 
Yes. <laughs> so, so what what were the memorable particular scenes or characters or personages or um, events oh, that... There was one incident that struck me that I really enjoyed and that I find really interesting as maybe kind of a characteristic of the book, almost almost a comment on the book. It's the sorry it's later on from where you are, Donna, but it's a scene mm, where no problem. he goes into a cavern and he encounters a, a monstrous form and then realizes that it's his own shadow. And then he has a companion and his companion has a monstrous form. And then they play with each other and the shadows. And so it's this very sort of humoristic almost scene with a kind of sardonic edge to it, you know? Uh, so it's like he's sort of saying, he's sort of stepping back and saying, this is play too, right? <laughs> What's going on here? It's not, it's not just recounting what things are going on. It's actually play. Mm. That, I, that struck me too. And, uh, and it's, it, it seems to be a, um, a sort of atmospheric phenomena that had to do with the mist like that yeah. would roll over that in that particular location. I think they call it demon shadow. The locals call it demon shadow, yeah. something like yeah. that. But the idea that he has a lantern. And so when you put the lantern down, the light casts the shadow. But it's as if it's appearing as a manifestation right, right in front of you. Uh, and at first, he doesn't know that it that it's that it's actually him and his friends comes out. Um, yeah, that was that was very um, interesting because it, it it comes also in it, it kind of I, maybe a few chapters after the encounters that he has with these real terrifying you know uh, figures. There's there's that one with the eagle that appears, uh, mm. and he has some terrifying dreams. Uh, as well, uh, and some other, you know, real scares uh, in in his in his experience. Although, although there's the one dream about the darkness that actually seems to be taken up by the real. I don't. Again, I don't know if it's a story element or whether it's really happened. But the whole incident with the woman and the blood, and the, what, the fact that she wants to be covered in blood, but it seems to hark back to the dream about the darkness that he had seems to be connected. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I wonder whether or not that conversation really happened. Uh, and if it did though, this was, she, it was really interesting woman. I have to say like the, con <laughs> the, the conversations that they're having this back and forth and the, the tete a tete and like, it's uh they're going very deep it's a very passionate love affair it seems that 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 they're having uh and uh d dangerous in a certain way like there's a kind of emotional danger there she's really yeah. describing her past traumas and uh she's so suicidal uh, when when he meets her um, and also the way that it's written it repeats itself the entire blocks of text that almost word for word repeat themselves throughout that. And, and so you're going, have I, am I, have I gotten lost? And, I, I, you know, I, and then you look back and you realize, no, 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 it's the same text that is. And so there's something very obsessive or very insidious going on there. It, it is a fascinating, I remember my, my wife studied uh, Kundera in, uh, she, she did a doctorate in literature and she started, she studied Kundera and part of her thesis was based on the unbearable light of lightness of being and, and books like that. And Kundera was uh, somebody who played a lot with the I in his books. Hmm. And I That's feel true. in some ways that this is post Kundera in a sense. It's, it's sort of uh, the next stage forward from that kind of attention to language that Kundera ha has in his writing, but in a different, a more extensive, more, more experimental in some ways, 
rewrite of that kind of preoccupation with you know, it's, mm. it's one of the senses I got from this. It's also a green book. I don't know if, if you have a color, but when I read it, I see, I, it feels like it's green. Mm -hmm. There's a bit about ecology as well. Uh, and the, the, um, the ways that pandas are being poached or uh, tigers can't be found anymore in the mountains. I mean, he's documenting part of that as well. One of the, you know, effects of industrialization and, mm. um, land reform and everything, you know, that of course now is you know, a thousand, a hundred times that what it was in, in, in the seventies or I guess eighties when, when he was doing this trip. Um, but I, I see that all these landscapes in my mind and, um, it's an outside book. It's the other thing. You know, there, there's weather in the book. There's, there's, there's animals, there's food. Uh, there, there, um, uh, you know, he, there, it, mountain climbing adventures, you know, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess it, it, it's, uh, it's, it gives me some, some kind of nostalgia or some kind of, uh, desire to be, to be out. <laughs> like that. <laughs> and, and is there one mountain or is it really many mountains? Because we don't seem to actually encounter the mountain, even though it's kind mm. of announced that way at the beginning. Mm. But maybe it's in the second part, I don't know. It seems to have just disappear. Like he was looking looking for Lingshan. Seems to be a real place. Uh, he's got a map from this person he meets on the bus. He has to go mm -hmm. to Wu Yuzhen first. And, and then he does find a place called Ling Yan. I don't know what that means, but soul something. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but after that, he, he's, he's, tr it seems to be traveling to different places. And according to the, you know, what I've heard or read, he traveled over 15,000 miles. So there are vast distances that, that are being covered here and different peoples um but it, it does evoke that like and of course i live near mountains so i i have i can transpose you know one scene a little bit onto onto the other and when i was in central america i was in, in the mountainous region and so i traveled perhaps very in a very similar way to, to the way that he did on buses and you know with the 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 the, lo the 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 local people the rural people with their chickens and everything like that i i think part of what he's describing is common to rural life uh to you know traditional rural you'll find similar kinds of uh even similar stories uh some different names different gods different mm. figures and practices but if you you travel through mexico you'll find uh, shamans or you know other medicine healers uh, mm. you'll find all kinds of very weird um, types of practices that are not taken ironically um, they're they're authentic and so there's also the this meditation on the you know what's happened on what what's happened to the these traditional worlds uh, and how much is lost uh, in the you know forward advance of modernity, and he makes no judgment about those things, the magical things. He could, but he doesn't. He sort of takes them as part of, of as part of the natural world. I I think so too. I, mean, I I I mean, there is that one episode where he's getting a fortune reading and and he gets cursed by the uh, uh, the, the the medium uh, woman. Uh, she says that there's a some kind of a red eye monster that is good. Yeah, and, and he gets, can't get her to tell him how to uh, how to how to be rid of the curse. Um, 
and and he thinks that she did that because he was not taking her seriously <laughs> that <laughs> he was there for the entertainment value of getting getting a reading done um but aside from that i i i sense that he sees i don't know like the the in the same just the natural value of different kind of cultures different cultural practices like this is it's a natural phenomenon i think is in it, and he's describing it in along the same spectrum that he would describe the environmental you know the, the mountains the rivers and, and so forth these these people are expressions of, of that same nature in, in but not purely because you have this overlay of the his, the military history and the political history and um it's it's a world that's dying is i think what he's and you have some of these animal forms that take on um characteristics that are a bit more than the animals would normally have so i'm thinking about the judong st- snakes that he describes as having this ability before you, before you even see them, they've already killed you. Yes, so. <laughs> I, read I read that chapter to my daughter. <laughs> she, it, it, not to scare her or anything, just because it, it was the one that I think she would like, uh, enjoy. Um, not as not as uh, complex as all the others. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Um, I don't mind, and you know, so, so sometimes we go a couple of hours. I'm okay to end, you know, in a little while here. Um, and I feel sick myself. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And we have, I don't know what Doug will think. I, I don't mind taking t- my time with this. I'm enjoying it. I, I, I want to look. I want to learn. I want to practice more Chinese. Mm-hmm. Just get my mind into that geometry uh and um do some more some more drawing uh i'm curious what the chinese characters are for you and and i Mm. and she i know what they are for soul and mountain and so i'm curious what they look like and maybe just meditating on those those characters will Mm. give some insight i don't know i mean I need something to hold on, something to grab onto, because mm-hmm. otherwise I'm totally lost in in to the culture, the language, every everything. I want, uh, I want, I want to weigh in. I have to go find my Mandarin dictionaries. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a lot too about how he's. He, I mean, he has a, a perspective on the Chinese language. He thought he he thinks that it has it's been um, in a way perverted by the attempt to standardize it. Yeah. We talked about mm-hmm. this a little bit last time to standardize it for the sake of Western, for Western translations. Uh, and, and so we can't access this uh, at all, obviously, but uh, uh, his intention was, and according to his translator, he, he is reworking the, even this, the, the, the syntax of, of the language and the way that he wrote this, he spoke it out loud uh, and he created recordings of each of the episodes. And then he wrote the text from his recordings. And the reason he said he, he did that was because he, he wanted to recapture, or revive the musicality of the language, the, mm-hmm. the, um, the sound aspect uh, of it. So that makes me a little frustrated because I can't hear it at all. I have no idea what it sounds like in Chinese. And, um, uh, although it reads very well, I have to say in English. And I, I think that I was skeptical at first about the value of reading a book in translation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I've read a lot, I've read a lot, I've done translation. I have nothing, but I, I just wondered whether I'd be really missing something essential. And like, I'm, I'm, if I really want to read it, I should just learn Chinese. And, but that's not going to happen very soon. <laughs> uh, so maybe there's a recording out there we can find. Mm-hmm. If I find one, I'll, I'll post it. I, I found some things on his artwork as well that I can post. There's some poetry in, uh, I think it's chapter 41, or again, we remember the poetry. And I do, 
I sense that the original would be more interesting than the translated version. There's something about the mm. it it is more traditional like poetry, and it, it I don't know. I, it feels a bit um, feels like I'm missing some of its depth when I'm reading it. You know, so. Um, mm. <clears throat> Mm. Poetry is always difficult to translate. I mean, you can translate prose easy, yeah, in a way easily, easily, but poetry has always been difficult to translate. I mean, when I read a poem in Arabic and sometimes some people attempt to translate it into English, it's always difficult. One of my professors back in college, he attempted to translate Shakespeare in a way that resembles, I mean, you know, like in a way uh, like Shakespeare been written in English, but still, I mean, it's difficult really to, to translate poetry. Mm. And you're right. I mean, how is I mean, it would be maybe different in Chinese. We can't tell how the translator, if he were, he or she, I think he's, it's a, he was able to translate the poem mm. and maybe transfer uh, not just the meaning, but uh, everything, the image, the words. Sometimes it, okay. one word can change many things, you know, in language. The ideograms have images built into them, right? And that's, I think, mm. why you're interested in them, Mark? Mm. Because, the, you know, so I can't remember what the, it might be the word I or something like that. It has a house symbol built into it. So there's a sense, you know, so there's a relationship between home and the eye of life. So a lot of these characters have images. So, so I do feel that poetry, the poetry, probably has some of these images that are in the ideograms and they were obviously extremely difficult to translate because you're going to translate mm -hmm. the sense of what is being said and not necessarily pick up those kinds of things. So there's a kinds of resonances that I think are mm -hmm. possible, but I mean, obviously I, I'm guessing. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, phenomen just phenomenologically in my mm -hmm. little experiment in writing in Ch uh, I can notice different things about how how I'm um, orienting toward toward language, and this is just my first you know, perception of it. But the going down and the kind of drawing and the multiple—it's a more complex uh, curvature in, in, in the script, uh, and it feels like you're drawing rather than maybe with you know if you get get used to it, it's it's but. Um, the going down is different because it. I'm just thinking out loud here, but it uh, it it almost feels like going deeper, if that makes sense. And this is just because you're going downwards. I mean, in the in the you're bringing something down instead of going across like this, writing, uh, and. I don't know what that means, you know, from whether that changes consciousness in some way, but uh, I think that these little things do. Uh, I mean, the fact, uh, a language that goes from right to left, one of the things that John Gebs mm -hmm. Gebser pointed out is that with the mental structure of consciousness, things go from left to right. And he associates that with the predominance of left. In the, he doesn't think in terms of the hemispheric brains, but, um, but that rightward motion as the forward motion of the of mental consciousness, whereas the leftward motion is a more conservative um, kind of past retrieving, past gathering, uh, and and the downward is something different. He, I, I'm just noticing that 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 the very way that one writes and reads mm. could affect how one resonates with the text, the mood of it. And the, and the ideograms have a kind of a base structure and then there's higher structure. And, and often the dictionaries show you the, the different pieces that go into the ideogram. So you can see the, 
pieces that go into them. And so if you can, you can, if you can get a text with the ideograms in it, you know, but then you would need to get the original. <laughs> you could do. I used to. I used to translate when I first started learning French. I used to take books, and they were often quite challenging books. And I would go, and I would tra- I would write in the English word over each word that I didn't know in a book, and there would be thousands of them, even on a few pages. But I would do this painstakingly, word at a time. That's how I learned to read in French. Um, And I did it more recently in the last few years with Italian. So the same kind of thing. And and in a way, with Google Translate, we've gotten far too lazy. We don't do that anymore. Uh, But although it's painfully slow, it was a good way to learn, you know, to, so I can read Italian newspapers and I can even read Italian books. It's slow going, but I can because I did this exercise with the, with, but, but I can't speak Italian. <laughs> so, but I'd like, I'd sort of be inclined to do something like this with the Mandarin if one could actually get to the text. But yeah. So. Yeah. Mm. It'd be very interesting because then you could more see the grammatical structure as well. Mm. Um, uh okay how are you how how are you feeling you both of you (laughs) (laughs) you the plural (laughs) yeah (laughs) we don't have a pronoun for for you all yeah (laughs) like in spanish you would say vosotros Mm. or ustedes Mm. uh Another matter. Um, In Arabic, we have uh, uh, the I and the U is dual. So we have duality in Arabic. So sometimes the U we are addressing two, and then we have addressing more than two as a pronouns. <laughs> so you have a singular U and a plural U. Yes, yes. Anta is, is Arabic, anta for singular, and tuma, it means both of you. And Tom, it means more than two. Oh. I think, yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah, we recognize <laughs> dual in Arabic, yeah. I was also wondering if the fact that you write the other way around, so left to right, <laughs> does that mean that Dunn's thought processes also work in some sense in another way, you know? So. <laughs> <laughs> I have a number of Arabic students, but uh, ah. Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any answers on that, but uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, I'm going to get going. Yeah, um, yeah, and um, but it's been guess- great. It, it I have a different sense of the reading. I think it'd be. It's a good yeah. way to take the reading forward to the next step. Yes. Do, do, will you have time to, to read over the next month, Donna? Yes, I think so. The next month, I think I, I would have uh, enough time to, I'll try my best to finish the book. Yes. Okay. I wanted to propose mm-hmm. an experiment too. No, yeah. Not for any time soon, for, I don't know, a few months mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'd be interested in trying to translate a story from Arabic, obviously ah. I don't speak Arabic, but you said yeah. that you uh, wouldn't write in English. Yes. But I wonder if if I'm writing in English and you're translating the Arabic, we could actually. Wow, that would be really interesting. Just an ex- a short experiment. Yes. Yes. Short, so that's all. I, I'm just. Yeah. It occurred to me last month, last yeah. time we met, yeah. and I didn't have a chance to, to yeah. message you, or had I? Did, it was on yeah. my list, but now that we're here. <laughs> I just want to plant the seed. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm I'm and I also want like I said last time some kind mm. of window into mm. where you live and what's going definitely, on. Definitely, definitely and the culture and the people. I but mean, remotely, yeah. Where you're based, Donna? Jordan. Oh, Jordan, so you are. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. We'll see you next time then. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.